The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Felix Moreno, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to the Gold Money Podcast. This is Felix Moreno. I'm talking to Mike Shedlock or Mish, uh, blogger at Global Economic Analysis and registered financial advisor at Sitka Pacific. Hello, Mike. Hi, it's a pleasure to be back on the show, Felix. Uh, people can find my blog by doing a Google search for Mish, M-I-S-H. It's just the first two characters of my first and last name. And I write about gold, interest rates, the global economy, China, everything that's in the news. I'm writing about it several times a day. And you seem to manage to keep tabs on what's happening all over the world. It's uh, pretty, <laughs> much, pretty amazing. Uh, you're also... I, I, I do. My big focus here lately has been Europe. So much is happening there. A lot. Uh, I can attest that. Uh, but uh, but uh, let's start off with the U.S. because we had uh, the Bernanke congressional testimony yesterday and he was asked some pretty funny stuff. Uh, even t- uh, at some point he was asked uh, whether he was printing money, to which he answered, not literally. <laughs> so what do you have to, what, what uh, are your thoughts on what Bernanke said yesterday? Well, well, of course he's printing money. He's even acknowledged that he's printed money. I've got a video clip of him telling, uh, I think it was CBS News, he said, we're printing money. So uh, he's, he's contradicting himself when he says that he's not. But all of this talk about taper, you can tell what they're trying to do. Interest rates on 10-year treasuries uh, went up over 100 basis points, one full percentage point, and uh, he's trying to talk them down. And interesting, mm. you know, yesterday he came out and said, oh, well, the, the market's finally starting to understand what we mean here. Is it really? You know, the, all we've seen is a little bit of a lull here in uh, the interest rate spike. Have, have they controlled it? What's that going to do with houses? Uh, uh, the mortgage rates are up even more than 100 basis points. And I think that's going to put a real crimp um, uh, in, in housing. As for their exit strategy, Bernanke knows, we all know that the Fed doesn't have one, that they intend to hold these assets, you know, to market all the way to the bitter end. There is no exit strategy. They don't plan on hiking interest rates. That's certainly very believable. He did say that. But you know what? What if the Fed's not in control, Felix? What if the Fed is not in control? And what if the bond market comes out there and and says, you know, we're just going to reprice these assets because uh, interest rates are, you know, too low. And what can the Fed do about that? Then I don't think they can. But um, just just for a, just for a second, there's a thought experiment. Let's imagine that they did try to exit. Let's imagine that they the Fed did stop buying you know, uh, half the new bond issues and uh, and uh, tried to actually get rid of some of the, of the massive bond holdings they've accumulated recently. Uh, what would happen to the bond market? Well, there's, there's two issues there. What if they, you know, just slow down or stop? And what if they if they go to sell? If they would actually go to sell, the um, uh, all the major brokerages would front run the trade. Interest rates would spike up like mad. If you take a look at the, uh, we've got interest rates here at near record lows, yet the amount of, of interest on the national debt of the U.S. is near all-time highs. So you tell me how that works hmm. if, uh, uh, if interest rates spike. So uh, clearly the Fed is not going to be hiking rates. And actually, the same holds true for banks around the world. You know, the, the uh, Japan is in a world of hurt if interest rates rise as much as, you know, two percentage points. So all these banks intend on holding this stuff, uh, these rates low. That, but that's their intent. You know, the problem for these guys is what if the bond market doesn't go along? We're seeing the beginning of a revolt here now with interest rates spiking up one percentage point. So is is that the start of something major or are things going to quiet down here now? I don't know, but uh, there's a big problem here if if things um, uh, 
<laughs> continue along the same path. Mm. Yeah, it's always a matter of timing, though, isn't it? Because uh, it's it's um, if you run for the exits too soon, you look like a fool. But if you if you um, start hearing real worrying signals and tremors, and you don't run at all, or you run too late, then you you you're wiped out. Well, that's that's pretty much it here. But uh, you know, the question is is uh, uh, the end of the bull market in Treasuries over? I think it is. Um, it's possible to me that it's not. I mean, you know, look how long the one in Japan lasted. Hmm. Could the one in the United States last equally as long? Um, uh, could rates drop more? Well, I don't rule that out, but I'm inclined to side with Bill Gross that the uh, bond market, the bull market in uh, bonds is indeed over. So uh, do you really want to be holding them if it is? And um, my conclusion would be no. So uh, and that's what poses a problem because it's not just new issuance. If uh, the banks and the brokers, you know, you know, all start trying to dump these things, well, someone's got to own them. Hmm. And the only way someone's going to own them is at higher yields. So Bernanke has a problem here, and he's actually stepping aside. You know, Janet Yellen is going to be the uh, 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 next FOMC president, next president of the Fed. But uh, so he's essentially dumping the problem on on her. Well, and she, I think she happens problem. to be she happens to be even more inflation prone than he is. I mean, Bernanke was she defined. Is. She is, yeah. The, uh, mm-hmm. Bernanke was defined by by his famous speech, deflation. Let's uh, make sure it doesn't happen here. But uh, apparently, Yellen's not happy with just um, stopping deflation. She she seems to want uh, to sp- speed up inflation quite a bit. She's one of the doves. Exactly, and it's and it's quite possible that that's one of the things that the bond market is reacting to right now in advance. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, we don't know. We don't see. We don't know who, for sure who the next. Uh, uh, Fed chairman's going to be, but uh, you know that's one of the key things. And uh, certainly, I see little value in Treasuries, even if the uh, uh, bull market in Treasuries is not over. Still, um, you, we're always talking about the U.S. Treasuries, but uh, if you look around Europe, European bond markets. Uh, haven't just uh, topped; they're actually starting to feel some of the pain. I mean, so far the the German Bund seems to uh, survive relatively unscathed, but the periphery bonds, as they call them, um, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and such like, have actually been hit quite hard. Uh, What do you think is going to happen after the German elections? Well, all those things, all those bonds uh, have been been ticking up, and and it's just all, you know, hard to say whether it's out of sympathy uh, to uh, uh, what's happening here in the United States or it's its own problem. But rest assured, uh, the, the banks in Europe are, uh, because they've loaded up on so much sovereign debt, mm. that sovereign debt allegedly has um, um, n- no risk to it at all when we've already <laughs> seen otherwise. We've seen otherwise in Greece. We've seen otherwise in uh, Cyprus. I think we're going to see otherwise in in uh, Spain and Portugal soon enough. So uh, the the banks in Europe are actually in worse shape than the U.S. banks because they are even more leveraged on uh, uh, government bonds than any of the banks here, you know, in the U.S. Mm. So uh, we've got elections coming up and uh, Merkel's trying to keep a lid on all of these things, on the blow up in the Italian government. Uh, the, the, there's a p- uh, potential uh, uh, crash of the Portuguese government. Mm-hmm. The uh, um, Mariano Rajoy is is having his own problems tied up in a uh, uh, lending scandal in 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 Spain. All these things are happening. I think they're all going to blow at once. Whether or not this happens before or after the German election. Uh, remains to be seen. We've got, what, a little bit more than a month to go here on that. Mm. But uh, the other interesting aspect about European politics 
is the, the market seems and the and the uh, economic pundits all seem to think that Merkel's a shoe in, and I seem to think she's not. Uh, she, sorry, she's what? The, I seem to think that Merkel is not necessarily a shoe in for German re-election. Certainly, CDU CSU is going to win the most votes, but the the, the problem is no one's going to come up with fifty percent, and which means that coalitions have to be built and. Uh, all of the other political parties essentially do not like Merkel. The price for a coalition government in Germany might very well be the ouster of Merkel. In fact, I, in fact, the FDP has already been paying the price, quite a heavy price electorally, for, or if we're to believe the polls, for having supported Merkel so far. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, SPD, they've come flat out and said they won't enter a coalition with Merkel, they're looking for a um, what is it called? A, the Red Green Coalition here, yeah. The, the uh, of SPD and uh, uh, the Green Party, but uh, you know they're pulling a little bit over forty percent. Hmm. Well, you know, with Merkel, with CDU, CSU just pulling, uh, and FDP just pulling forty three percent. Well. It doesn't take much to swing this election from here. And the, the wild card to me is the AFD party. It's a Eurosceptic party. Uh, uh, and anti-Euro as well. Anti-Euro, yes, yes. Anti, decidedly anti-Euro. And I could conceive of them getting as much as 10% of the vote, but anything over five makes it even harder for Merkel to form you know, any kind of, of reasonable coalition. And an obvious coalition would actually be CDU, CSU, and and, and AFD. That's right. But uh, uh, on the other aspects, other than the euro, so you know, politics rates to be a a mess here after the German elections, and I don't think that's priced in at all. Neither do I. But also, I think the the repercussions for for other European countries who are depending on German bailouts. Uh, will be very, very important. I mean, I, I think there's uh, there's a lot of um, problems that are waiting just before, below the surface, as you said, in the bond markets and elsewhere in Europe, which won't surface, won't rise up until after the German elections. But let's talk a bit about China, uh, Mish, because we um, you've mentioned several times that um, China might be having a bit of a slowdown, that the economic data coming out of China is worrying lately. Well, actually, it's not worrying at all. Uh, uh, we would be, we should be worried if uh, China is not slowing. Actually, I think China is slowing way more than anyone thinks. There's a certain electricity usage uh, figures that would suggest that perhaps China's not even growing at all, or maybe growing at one or two percent. The uh, big problem in China is just a massive, massive, massive amount of of, of public debt. And it's it's in the uh, uh, form of these state owned enterprises that are absolutely insolvent here. And so what are they going to do about that? So uh, uh, the only way to fix this problem is to privatize these things, slow it down, do something about the credit, you know, have write offs. But all of that is is going to point to, you know, not China slowing from 10 percent to eight or even seven, but all the way to one or two. Hmm. This is what Michael Pettis at China Financial Markets believes. This is what I believe. And uh, so, you know, we'll see. Right. And the repercussions of this are uh, pretty severe. I mean, take a look at how Australia is impacted by this. If uh, if China stops building all this roads, build bridges, houses, you know, they've got empty cities, vacant cities, vacant housing all over the place. So uh, then China stops importing so much commodities. This puts pressure on commodity prices, uh, raw material prices, the base metals, uh, and uh Australia's already got a problem with its mining sector, with the China slowdown, and uh, with its own housing bubble crash. So the emerging markets, the commodity-producing countries, are going to get re hit really hard here by China's slowdown. And I don't think that's priced into the global economy either.
In, in, words, in fact, in fact, the problems in Brazil lately seem to stem precisely from that source. Exactly. And I've written about Brazil. And Brazil is such a funny case because uh, 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 a year ago they were complaining that their currency was too strong. Now they're complaining the currency is too weak. They're trying to prop it up. Oh, you know, good luck with that because the market's turned. This is one of these cases, and it's going to come up again in Japan. Uh, be careful. You get what you ask for. They wanted a weaker currency. Now they don't like it because they've got an inflation problem. But, but sorry, Mish, we're talking about a weak economy in the U.S., uh, huge problems in Europe, a slowdown in China. Uh, can you can you explain to me how oil, how Brent is still 109 and West Texas is almost 100 again? Uh, how is oil so high with such a big global slowdown? Well, with all the liquidity out there, and certainly central banks are trying to do that, money is going to go somewhere. Mm. Now, the Fed and the central banks want it to go into small and medium prized uh, lending. They want it to go into uh, corporate hiring, but it's not. The, instead, the money is going in, I believe it's going in speculation in, in oil. It is um, going in speculation, certainly in the stock market hmm. and the bond market. We're just beginning to see a revolt in the bond market now saying, hmm, you know, wait a minute. Uh, so, you know, that is, I think, one of the, you know, explanations. We've also got some turmoil in, 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 in the Mideast. But essentially, it's money looking to go somewhere, but not where central banks want it to go. And the other place money is going, ironically enough, is in capital investments, capital improvements. The price of money is so low, companies can go out there, they can expand in all of these technologies that are actually going to eliminate people. So rather than hiring people, Banks can borrow it from the bond market at one or two percent. So they're doing that with some, you know, buying some pretty expensive stuff to eliminate people. Mm. And so I believe the Fed's actions are actually central bank actions in general are actually counterproductive here. So let's talk about gold for a minute. Um, if we're seeing all these um, all these monetary injections, if we're seeing uh, artificially low interest rates, um, how should that impact gold? What, what what do you consider the gold fundamentals are? How would you value it? Well, the, 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 how you value it and the gold fundamentals, I mean, you have to recall that there's over 150,000 tons of gold. All the gold that's ever been mined is is still out there in existence. So I see these reports and they say, and you see it from mainstream media where, you know, uh, uh, oh my gosh, you know, mining production is up a hundred tons or central banks are buying a hundred tons or, or central banks are selling a hundred tons or whatever. You know, a hundred tons is essentially meaningless when there's 167,000 tons of gold out there. Yeah. Let me, <laughs> let, let me just say it's even, it's even more exaggerated because when Cyprus collapsed, we saw some people saying that the Cyprus's gold reserves were being in play where what was going to move the market. And there we're talking about 14 tons or some ridiculous number. Y- yes, yes, exactly. Now, oddly enough, that 14 tons is very important to Cyprus, that 14 tons you know, might be enough to prevent, should Cyprus have left the euro, it might have been enough to prevent hyperinflation in in, in Cyprus. So th- that uh, th- that value of that 14 tons to Cyprus was very real. But that value of that gold, its meaning, its meaning to the market in general is non-existent. So, uh, uh, People are analyzing this gold in completely wrong ways, looking at demand for jewelry and looking at hmm. uh, 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 14 tons here, 100 tons there, as if it's meaningless, as if it's meaningful when it's really not. You know, the the marginal utility for gold is whatever it happens to be at the time. And and right now, that's... that's uh, 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 Twelve to thirteen hundred dollars an ounce. 
So uh, I expect that to rise. Generally, you know, um, uh, these kinds of environments with all this money uh, flowing is generally good for gold, but generally does not mean necessarily. And that's what we've seen here now. Mm. There's uh, uh, and, and, and one of the reasons I think for the weakness is gold is what I would call a bubble belief in the Fed that the Fed has everything under control, that the ECB has everything under control. I think we're going to see quickly enough, soon enough, that the ECB and the Fed don't have everything under control. And uh, that's going to start the next leg up in the gold bull market. Now, precisely when that happens, I don't know. But that's how gold tends to react in these crises. Although at any time it can, you know, react just as it is. But uh, Mish, the reason I ask you about the fundamentals is because eventually the gold bull market will end, like it did in the eighties. And um, and for those who, instead of looking at the price or doing technical technical analysis or trying to uh, react after the fact, um, if you have some way of valuing gold or at least knowing what's bullish for gold and what's bearish for gold in in the macro in the macro trends uh you can sort of not call the end of it but you can see how it would end and how it wouldn't end uh in the case that of many people now calling the end of the gold bull and so on uh so for instance interest rates in the in the 70s and 80s we saw volcker raise interest rates a huge amount in a very short time um do you think if that happened now, well, if it could possibly happen now or in five years' time, it would end the gold bull? Well, it's, it's, I think it's impossible for that to happen. If it does, it's going to cause a currency crisis, and that's not necessarily going to be bad for gold. So uh, uh, I don't think one can compare you know, this kind of, of, of market with what a rise in interest rates would do or even mean right now compared to w- what happened in the 70s. You had a stagflationary environment. You, you know, prices were spiraling out of control. Right now, you know, all the hyperinflation is here have been, have, have, have been absolutely, you know, dead wrong. I think they're, 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 they're likely going to remain to be wrong. Yet that, that, that money, as I said, th- that the Fed and central banks are doing is, is likely going to go somewhere. Now, one possible way to evaluate gold is to just say, you know, what would the price be if we took every dollar in circulation and said that it was backed up by gold? And, you know, I've seen various targets here of, of between three and ten thousand dollars. It's not necessarily my prediction that that gold gets that high. But but, you know, that's one possible way, you know, one could look at this. How, how high it actually goes or whether it could get there. But I, I do think that fiat currencies are going to blow up in some sort of manner that's uh, uh, going to be good for gold. And um, I would just leave it at that. I don't like putting price targets on this like other people do. And worse yet, people put price targets and time frames on it hmm. both at the same time. And uh, that really you know gets one in trouble. I just happened to look at gold here at, at, at twelve hundred bucks. It was at nineteen. This this is a a normal size correction. It's not necessarily a. I mean, it's a decent size correction, but gold's gone through these forty percent corrections before. It doesn't look to me that the fundamentals here have 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 changed at all. And uh, I think gold's going to come back in play. So you know, my advice is to buy gold here, buy some miners here. And I did, and I did a post on that, and I uh, mentioned all the miners that that uh, uh, that, that I like. And uh, you know, can I be wrong? Yeah, but my intention here is to not trade this and just hold it until the market sees things my way. And I, I'm pretty convinced that the market's going to see things this way of my way eventually hmm. because the fundamentals have not changed. I agree. I I want to get back in a minute. To your because you talked about deflation, hyperinflation. I I just ha- love that debate. But before that, I wanted to ask you about Bitcoin because you you did an interview with uh, Roger Ver with the Bitcoin Jesus on your blog not long ago, and uh, and you you've 
mentioned it sometimes, and uh, still, you say you're not very convinced. You're not a convert. No, I. Why should I be a convert here? The 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 free market would not settle on something conjured up out of out of thin air as money. Now, the 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 reason why it's happened is because of what central banks are doing, and someone's looking for another alternative. Throughout history, um, the market has, where gold has been available, the market's always decided that gold was money. When gold hasn't been available, then it's been silver, or perhaps it's been copper, or uh, uh, in the early days of the United States, uh, it might have been beaver pelts. Hmm. But the, the, the market has you know, always decided on you know something that just couldn't be you know conjured up you know out of out of you know thin air now supposedly there's a limit on the number they're going to do but you know were it not for government intervention intervention forcing the dollar to be you know viewed as money i don't think we would see the rise of bitcoin and uh, certainly if gold came back into vogue here as as uh, as money, Bitcoin would go away. But Bitcoin has other problems. The the you know the government can just come by at any time and say you know they did it once to uh, uh, and just you know outlaw transactions in Bitcoin. Then the currency goes to being immediately worthless. Well, Mish, so, Mish uh, let me just uh, try to push you a bit more in Bitcoin's direction because there's, um, you have to uh, see that it's not just money, it's also a payment system. It's a technology. So just the same as you can use Skype or email, uh, even though it's, you know, it might be replaced by something better in a while and it's just uh, a tool. Uh, the internet needs something that can act like cash and you can't do that with Bieber pelts or even with gold at the moment. Well... I mean, you can certainly do it with U.S. dollars. You can do it with euros. You can do it with yen. Well, I not mean, really, not really, because if you want to accept donations on your blog or subscriptions on your blog, uh, you would have to go through some kind of payment system to accept euros or dollars. You would have to go through a credit card or some or PayPal or some kind of payment system. And say uh, you have a subscriber from Somalia or from uh, I don't know from uh, South America. Um, they might not have access to a credit card or to a, the general Western banking system. And that's where Bitcoin steps in. Well, but how do you get Bitcoins? You got to buy them. You've got to conduct a monetary transaction. You got to, you got to get that. You got to get the money to convert, you know, into Bitcoins in the first place. So well, you, uh, you can, you can earn them, you know, there's quite a market right now for, for labor paid in Bitcoins. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, I know, I know, I know. You'll never be convinced, but I earnestly encourage you to to at least try, experiment, it. try to accept donations in your blog in bitcoins. See what the result is. It, it takes <laughs> well, about got thirty free, seconds. I've got a free that. policy on my blog. Uh, everything <laughs> I write is free. So, uh, um, uh, unlike uh, a lot of other <laughs> bloggers, I, I don't have a, uh, a tip jar out there, but uh, uh, and I have no plans to put one out there. But I do have my first Bitcoin. And following the, uh, the the interview with Bitcoin Jesus, he sent me a Bitcoin. The um, uh, n not precisely sure here what that thing is worth now, <laughs> but I have one. Let's talk a bit about Japan, because I, I feel it's the most extreme case with uh, Shinzo Abe promising inflation at all costs and bringing out the cheerleaders for, for people to buy, uh, to buy, to try and buy all things Japanese. The government has to tell them to buy and buy stocks and so on. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? Uh, I, I think Japan is headed for a currency crisis, probably the, the first country to have one. The uh, uh, and they have this idea that they can generate uh, two or three percent inflation and hold the interest rates in Japan on government bonds at a half percent. <laughs> you think that's possible? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. And. Um, the, the, the there's all kinds of repercussions to it. 
they first off, if they succeed in uh, trashing their currency, which I think they're going to do, uh, it's going to uh, exasperate their problems on all their imports. And since Japan produces uh, virtually none of its uh, uh, own oil and gas, uh, uh, it's going to exasperate their their uh, uh, trade problem. So uh, then, you know, the the second thing is that um, Abe is, because the balance of trade is going to be impacted, they're going to need to raise money, and Japan has has recognized that. Uh, Abe wants uh, to hike taxes in Japan. <laughs> By a massive amount, uh, and what is that going to do to their economy? Right, so, so it's like the trifecta; it's going to absolutely destroy them, right? High inflation, uh, crashing high currency, inflation, crashing high taxes, markets, and high taxes, and and a um, balance of trade problem. So yes, I mean, well, you know, in in theory, Japanese is going to be you know exporting more. Okay, so they export more cars. But, you know, what about all the oil they import? What about all the food they import? You know, what about uh, uh, everything else? So uh, I think they're quickly going to find out, as did Brazil, that once they achieve this thing called inflation, and once they achieve this thing like devaluing their currency, they're going to see that it's not the good thing that they think it is. And the, the problem then with Japanese government debt at, at 240% of GDP, it's going to cause far more repercussions than they believe. Uh, so Japan is heading for a currency crisis, and uh, the trade to take advantage of that actually is to be long Japanese equities, but hedged for a collapse in the uh, price of the yen, that's a trade that I am in. Nice, nice. Although, although the timing will be complicated, but it does look like time is running out, isn't it? Um, the again, I don't want to put a time frame on this, but uh, Japan is in trouble, and I I don't think we're talking about a five year time frame anymore. Mm. You know, we're talking about months to a couple of years, maybe. Uh, we're almost running out of time, but I'd like to, uh, um, I'd like to ask you again about uh, deflation versus inflation or versus hyperinflation. Uh, you've mentioned, you've been one of the few Austrians or Austrian school um, sympathizers who, who has bet for the past few years on a deflationary scenario instead of an inflationary one. And uh, you seem to have been right, or at least those who are betting on high inflation straight away have been wrong. Absolutely, they've been wrong. And uh, they don't understand uh, credit. I don't think they understand, you know, what's going on here in the job market. I don't think they understand uh, the impact of, of the housing bust and all that debt that's out there. And, and, and just the amount of debt that's out there is just acting as an overall drag on the economy. Most of these guys, you know, just look at, at what central banks were doing and saying, my gosh, this is going to cause hyperinflation. I looked at it and said, um, no, it's not. And um, certainly I would say that, you know, I've been on the right side of that. Uh, the... Uh, there's a lot of people out there that think that uh, inflation is way understated. And, and certainly if you look mm. at education, if you look at uh, 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 health care, uh, that would be the case. But it's not the case if you look at food, which I think is um, um, reasonably steady. And it's not the case looking at technology. It's not the case looking at wages. It's not the case looking at a whole bunch of, of, of other things. So uh, um, this doesn't mean that Bernanke's done a good job, <laughs> far from it. This just means th th that we've not paid the price for it yet. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an Austrian uh, uh, economist. Well, and I'm not an economist, but uh, uh, I'm, you know, in that school of thinking. 
And uh, to me, the you know simple way, simplest way to describe it is uh, that the free market knows best. It, it would it would set the correct supply of money. It would set the correct interest rates. It would um, uh, a non uh, would get government out of the way, and businesses would would know better how to influence how to spend their capital and on what, rather than the government trying to micromanage things. Hmm. Certainly, if you look at the history of the Fed and central banks in general, they've blown one bubble after another after another. Uh, the free market's never been tried. And uh, all Austrians are saying is, uh, you know, give it a try. And uh, certainly that's the school, you know, that I'm in. And the alternative is micromanagement of, of, by central banks that has never been proven ever in history to work. Central planning. What a great, central wonderful planning. That's idea. That's what it amounts to. <laughs> the, it, it's very tantamount to uh, uh, the days of central planning in Russia, where Russia uh, had its target on how much steel should be produced how much cars should be produced, how much everything should be produced. Well, when you uh, 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 produce too much, you know, the price crashes. When you don't produce enough, prices soar, and the government can never get its production right and could never, you know, pay enough. So there were always shortages of things until, and there always will be shortage of things and mispricings of things surpluses of things if the government pays too much for an item you'll have overproduction of of those items so uh the only thing that makes any sense is for the government to get out of the way let the free market work and people don't even understand this is the sad thing the free market i think the free market caused this housing crash no it was government interference you know pushing houses pushing the uh uh, uh, the Home Ownership Society. But Mish, uh, but Mish, there's, uh, there's people who, who um, claim to be very pro-free market, but they think that there's some kind of exception for, for the price of money and for the production of money, that it's not like steel or shoes or any other product, and that uh, government really does know best there. The, the, that is it. <laughs> they, 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 they don't understand. They think that somehow money is different. Well, Actually, money is a commodity whose um, uh, main purpose is uh, uh, serves as a role in trade and a pricing mechanism. But if you think of money as a commodity, you know, uh, and so why should uh, the government or the Fed or any individual know the what the supply of any commodity should be other than any other commodity? And I don't think they do. And they've proven it. Well. I uh, thank you very much, Mish. We're going to have to end it here. It was great talking to you. We'll love to have you back. And uh, well, we'll be very interested to see what happens in the next few months, given the, the warnings you've given. This was uh, Mish Shedlock from Global Economic Analysis. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, pleasure to be on the show. People can find me by doing a Google search for Mish, reading my blog. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.